That being said, off to the track, time to nuke the Nep mystery. For me, Neptunia is a priceless franchise despite its writing inadequacies. I've platinumed every game of the franchise in some capacity on PlayStation. Doubt me, feel free to look at my PlayStation account called Dead4346. So in all honesty, I would consider myself to be the most qualified person to commentate on the Neptunia franchise as a result, spending thousands of hours of my life on this series, not even counting the various videos on the series away from streaming, should give me enough authority on the matter, let alone my various writing skills. Let us continue the trend of out-of-the-box content. This one is going to be a bit more controversial, as is my incendiary relationship with the fan base in general. I generally hold a rather unique viewpoint and modus operandi with Neptunia and have an equally uniquely unorthodox status amongst my fellow fans. Enough about me as a fan, back to the topic at hand. So, I think you will enjoy the rankings list down below from worst to best. But before I do the official rankings, here is the honorable mention. When I first compiled a list of my favorites, Super Neb RPG had yet to be released in English, so I will just honorably mention Super Neptunia RPG as somewhere lurking between 4th and 2nd, depending on the day and how I feel about it. There is an earthly magic charm in both mechanics and in the smallest of details, and its charm is in its indie game-like design. Everything from classic, paper-esque text boxes, fantastical fantasy-themed art style, and coloration, and a cascade of variety and design, while remaining true to the base image associated with each landmass. It is a game I highly recommend. So, starting off with the worst game of all. Mega Tag Mansion Blanc and Neptune vs. Zombies blah blah blah. Man, there are so many things I dislike about this game, and the only thing I do truly like about this game is their hard rock metal OST. It is the only saving grace of this game, and I am going to explain why. Keep in mind, these are personally game-breaking for me specifically, and whether you agree or not is best left to the comments section. First and foremost, it is heavily plagiarizing old zombie movies, and possibly High School of the Dead. I find it rather suspicious, or rather a little bit sus, that Neptunia nails almost exactly every cliche within the anime High School of the Dead, and it's probably the only thing more relevant than the B-movie flicks that Megatag is supposed to be an intentional ripoff of. That is a small hindrance in of itself. It is all supposed to be reflecting of how intentionally cheesy the old movie genre is, but the problem is that it's, it isn't a uh, intentional deconstruction or commentary of these flicks. They just reuse the cliches in an even worse fashion. They are just retreads, not anything new or exciting. Nothing about the story within the gameplay comes across as some clever knockoff or satire. You want something that is competent in the previously mentioned subject matter? Play Yakuza Kiwami and the uh, and the zombie movie ripoff that Goro Majima is the main character in Yakuza Dead Souls. I believe that's what it's called. However, that is only half of the subgenres make a tag groups off. The other is bad idol anime. Most notably, Love Live. It features the same exact baby hook as Love Live. It features Noir as an idol, even if it is just a side event. But more importantly, it is the same we must become X and Y celebrities so we can save the skew that Love Live is predicated on. And the more savvy you are in anime, the starker each cliche becomes and what it rips off. The issue is that it has long past being cute and is just an annoying retread. Do not even get me started on how the mechanics are almost exactly Control C, Control V, aha, of Action U. Only without the one feature that made the shitty ARPG's tan Soft makes to be good. Dress break. Yeah, I am the one guy who thought it was a good idea. Action U was better than this dumpster fire. It did not feel like it plotted on for days on end. The trend that Tamsoft has with me is that it consistently gets worse somehow. Animation quality, for example. The amount of character models on the screen is cons is constantly less, so are the subtle animations of which are engaging. Action U had full expressions and breathing animation and character rotation. Mega Tag had less character models, less expressions, and no rotation. Even worse, Four Goddesses Online had no breathing whatsoever, with only fade transitions and using character still renders for differing expressions. We have gone full 2009 as a result. Congratulations for ending up going backwards a decade, Compile Heart, and Tamsoft is 
is all to blame. Well, that and your constant acceptance of Tamsoft being a creator with your IP. And the reason why this is important is engagement. See, with Action U, you could easily see and be engaged with your attention of what's going on on the screen. There's less engagement overall because there's less movement and things for your eyes to keep track of. When your content is so fucked that I cannot even enjoy Unigear bait, you know you have an awful game. Speaking too long about it will just give me high blood pressure, so it is just best to move on to the next one. For Dimension, Neptunia Victory. And that crap I spoke too soon. Yeah, a lot of people are either going to be pissed off at me or purely apathetic towards me the more I go on. Well, enjoy yourself while I dance like the Joker as the Nept fandom burns. This game, for whatever awful reason, is considered a somewhat decent, somewhat good game that quote-unquote saved the Neptunian franchise. Anything remotely close to this opinion baffles me. It is one of the most disgusting, vile game stories I have played, so I have a lot of ground to cover through many points. A. The story pacing. The game paces its story so slowly that you would be forgiven for taking a Plutia tier nap. If that is the intent, well then, 10 out of 10 base, best game, Nap Simulator. That's sad to say, I do not quite think that was the goal. Not only is the entire concept of Iris Heart supposed to be a sadist, but that becomes a death of the author metatrope and word of god metatrope, because she, const she constantly contradicts that trope at every turn despite the will of the author. Despite that, somehow, some way, she's still perceived as a sadist, and is only you know perceived as such because of visual iconography. This game handles its characterization so poorly that nothing good in this game is intentional. Anything good about this series, yes, that includes Mr. Bad Anani, Death, and Copypaste, it's solely unintentional. Victory struggles to get ideas out at all, let alone good ones. Plutia is an awful idea of a sadist, or as some may claim, a poor idea of the concept of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, which is what the dichotomy of Plutia's personalities are. Ray writes is the worst form of a redemption arc in the sense that all you really need to do in order to understand her shallow characterization is listen to Coldplay's Viva La Vida. It nails her almost exactly in characterization. However, the reason why Neptunia Victory ranks higher than Mega Tag is that, to their credit, even if unintentional, they do get a few things right. Anani Death and Mr. Bad are a couple exceptions to the Victory doesn't promote interesting content. Well, I would have to say that once again, the stories that Naoko Mizuno and Kampai Heart crank out often lead to me like in the villains more than the heroes, and that is just plain sad. They are the three characters that entertain me most without making me want to go full angry German kid and wrecking all my things. Here's the problem, though. The story length is so plotting and without proper justification for it. Our devotion to more is a reference point of an example that is just, has justification. There are so many characters involved that take up so much runtime that if you trim the excess fat of dialogue and screen time, you could save several hours on end. It gets worse if you add in the DLC characters. It is just awful. Pishi is, of course, only remotely good in drama because of a Nani Death's involvement. Now, Neptune and Victory not only checks off every bad trope or anime reference imaginable, such as Sword Art Online and Isekai before Isekai was a subgenre, but they do not even really succeed at making these tropes and references to be funny. Speaking of humor, this is objectively the worst and crudest one of the series by far. I mean, there are jokes about hermaphroditism, lactation, and sadism constantly, yet it's even still false. I would say the biggest attack on your intelligence is the humor. The OST is either unmemorable, inoffensive, or are memorable for the wrong reasons. The last of the category are Iris Heart's theme and that of the Seven Sages. I solely remember Iris Heart's theme as 80s porn music and the Seven Sages theme as the worst character of disco. So, here's the rundown of themes and ideas Neptunia Victory tackles, and I will give you a grade as to each. Time and dimension travel. This is the only idea posed that is not only competent, but ironically enough, to be good. The rules are solid in how time passes between different dimensions, as it takes full advantage of the times each dimension is in, in regards to when Plutia's and Neptune's eras were. It is difficult to balance set references and juxtaposing them, while giving an equal balance 
called Scale and how time passes between two eras. I will give the story theme an A rank. Next is Transgenderism Gender Identity. This is mostly embodied by Anani Death because despite being biologically male, and even that is questionable because we never get to see what he actually is, he has the heart of a maiden. Anani Death is, you know, colloquially and casually able to be referenced as trans. There's just no going around it. Anani Death's character explores these concepts, albeit in a limited capacity, while also portraying Anani Nason as a funny, witty character, inevitably making Anani Nason more than just a simple cool conceptual allegory. I give this thematic a B. Sadomasochism. Just gonna say that for reasons previously mentioned above, I am not going to just give an F for this colossal failure of a character. I am going to temporarily rip off my friend and give this concept an F Mega. Redemption Art. This is where I get most frustrated with this game, and just generally the series in general. As a writer, writing a redemption arc should be one of the easiest concepts to write. However, when you write a character whose past, present, and future actions are completely incongruent with the idea of seeking redemption, it destroys justification for telling us about her desire instead of showing it. It is a case of using tell instead of show, and it is utterly infuriating. F. Faction of Villains. I would love to give this a higher rank, because some of the villains are just great. But unfortunately, it relies too heavily on the no honor amongst thieves dynamic. Credit where credit is due, it is later subverted when Warchu acts like an absolute chad of a badass by sacrificing himself so that R4 can get away. Albeit in typical compile hard fashion, they undermine it with a retcon. However, this retcon happens in record time when Warchu is scared out of his mind and is using his honor as a means of trying to create an illusion of machismo. It wasn't a, it was a bluff the entire time. You can imagine my annoyance. D plus. Shoujo I Yuri. Not a difficult thing for Neptunia or Neptunia Victory to pay out on. It has always been a thing they are at least, you know, competent as. Competent at. Such as Uni and Nepgear ships that have been around since they came into existence. For example, for example, the romance scene in Mega Tag Mansion that ironically did it right only to blue ball you. C. References to some some degree, they are doing a good job. They are faithful to each character's gimmick and background. The Sega Pluto is faithful to Plutia as a character. Mages functions like its main franchise is designed, i.e. Stein's Gate. However, there are times when where they are not consistent with their references. Namely, stuff akin to the Lotus Eater machine, like the SAO knockoff at the beginning of the game. B minus. Well, there is one other issue I want to address. The scout system. The scout system is the easiest way to break your game Gameplay. The scouts make it so easy to cheese out boss fights that it becomes ridiculous. All you must do each time is send the scout out to a dungeon, enter that dungeon, leave that dungeon, and go home ad nauseum until you get the items you need. With enough time crunching, it should present zero difficulty with cheesing through all bosses, even under level. Oh, and Histy is so boring as fuck. DLC characters in that tiny game are almost paid to win. Thankfully, this pick fixes and rectifies the issue to a certain degree. I would imagine Neptunia Reaper 3. Oh yeah, get that salt in there, motherfucker. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, there is not much change to the gameplay experience. Just some cosmetic changes in the visual interface and some rebirth mechanics mixed together like a Frankenstein creation. There is nothing, there is literally nothing different about it, unless you have a PC version, of which you can buy a waifu quest line for 1995, where you can marry one of the Neptunia girls. Problem is, you have got to be massively broken in level to be able to reach said event without being one-shotted. No thanks on that grind, worst kind of paywall. So one final positive trait, the scout system is far better balanced. Next. Cyber Dimension Neptunia for Goddesses Online. You angry disappointed yet, bro? Well, in that case, let me ramble as to why you should be angry f at me for putting it so low. For all its failures of basic animations, for its failures to produce a decent multiplayer interface that extends beyond 2005 RuneScape, for all the horrendous writing, which we'll get to in a minute, people still enjoyed this game. Probably because the fanbase collectively gave up on this franchise after being good again, that instead of demanding a better product, they simply chose to be equal 
equally in low or equally as low in expectations as Neptunian gives nowadays. It does have small improvements, by the way. No more generic cybernetic dungeon design. The dungeons themselves look incredible on top of that. I am hoping, being and pleading to make the character outfit designs in the game canon. I do enjoy the villains of this game too. Speaking of which, I can finally delve into the many reasons why I hate this spinoff and thereby tam style. Hey, the story does so little for me in making me like the main cast that it makes me root for the villains in the even more passionate fervor. Albeit, yet again, I do not think Four Goddesses Online's writer could successfully write moral ambiguity, so pardon me for pressing X to doubt the writer's ability to have the villains intentionally being written as sympathetic. If anything, it is purely unintentional based on Neptunia's generally black and white sense of morality. Besides, the villains are too well acted. Also, I liked anti-hero characters like Kuro Nekohime and Kyria. B. The OST, while I like it, does have a weakness. Certain songs often bleed into each other, which is a rookie mistake of song composition and direction. The multiplayer was god-awful. If it were not for the fact that I got to make fun memories and new friends on Four Goddesses Online, on its own merit, it is almost WWE 2K20 tier. That is a bit of a hindsight scope on its multiplayer. Hyperdimension Neptunia Rebirth 1. Here's where BLM riots start happening, but this one is a bit of a tale. So sit down, relax with the refreshments of your choice, and let the pompous one tell you a tale of an up journey. I happen to have started with this game, and have had a mini priceless memory with this game. I remember being filled with pride as I went in Platinum Rebirth 1. My first Nep game in my first PlayStation Platinum. However, as I went and journeyed across the numbers, I came across a shocking revelation. The Rebirth 1 I treasured so much, as I actually shallow and guttered, or gutted, massive character development. See, what Rebirth 1 does is steal the bare bones of the very first Neptunia game created by Compile Heart, and gutted many a character's development and progression. See, in the original Neptunia game, for example, and this is only one of many, when Nep asks the other CPUs to help defeat R4, the other CPUs refuse. They refuse to work with Neptune, and honestly, as far as her character was concerned, rightfully so. They had no interest in supporting an emotionally immature brat with no understanding of who she originally was. An example of when the Neptunian trope of amnesia was actually correctly utilized. So, here's where the other paradigm shift in her characterization comes in. In the original Neptunian game, Neptune actually chooses to recover her memory, something Rebirth 1 attempts to subvert, which to a degree is successful. It is just not an appropriate usage of a subversion. This is one of those cases where you actually play it straight. These things about the OG Neptunia game display what is known as character development. It forced Neptune to learn and grow for the greater good. It also played off well against IF and Kampa, who played emotional support in the original game. You could actually feel love and passion for the OG Neps. It actually had a soul to its story. I can't say the same for something as as half-hearted as Rebirth 1, which is sad because it break up my heart though, to have to see Rebirth 1 in such a cynical light. Rebirth 1 falls flat to the OG predecessor that could not only tell an actual good joke, but the entire cast had a personality, and even the tonal management was better in the original game. And who could forget Compass Grandpa that never made another mansion in the franchise ever again. So next is Hyperdimension Neptunia Rebirth 2 Sisters Generation. Here's the thing. Overall, the best out of the OG trilogy, while the OG comes in Mark II in a close second. However, for all the talk about censorship in 2019 and 2020, pretty much nobody complained about Rebirth 2 and how it was altered to change your experience. Not only are the mechanics from Rebirth 1 back, which ironically originated from Mark II anyhow, but are slightly improved. Let's see, there are two reasons why I rank it so low. A. The Holy Sword ending. I cannot ever rip on this ending enough. There is no such thing. It deserves all the flack in the world for constantly being unoriginal and yet another undeserved subversion. While I understand wanting your waifus to win instead of die, it should not come at the cost of such a cheap subversion. Instead, it should have been its own original ending entirely with an actual justification of the threat of the deity of sin. Even worse, the ending is solely made on censorship meta, i.e. censorship 
constrained language and thrusting its in its subversion for the sole sake of lowering a game rating. Which, while understanding for a company to do so, and I sure as hell wouldn't, uh, you know, avoid the idea of expanding my audience. However, it should not come at the cost of butchering an ending. B. I do not know if this is unique to the Vita version, or if it is a consistent problem across all platforms, but I constantly dealt with freezing issues, particularly with an R-Force factor. I eventually learned how to save scum to get around it, but even if it's just the Vita version, it is still bad game design to have such a game-busting bug. I still have a lot of positives of that to mention, though. A. As usual, the grim, the grim dark settings amazing. B. I enjoyed the shoujo I, as always. C. The conquest ending is so great. D. The OST does a phenomenal job with ambiance. Oh, wait! I forgot Stella's Hell Dungeon! Ha! <laughs> that fucking sucked too! Next, Mega Dimension Neptunia V2 R. Well, with this one, it's rather self explanatory. V2R is just another obnoxious retread, this time of V2, of which they just tried to, you know, latch that onto the VR craze at the time. However, it's fine because at least it at least does some things different and interesting with the menu interface. It's if you explore Mark II's general gameplay mechanics, expanded upon them, and interjected them with steroids, while also adding in a couple of CGs and one new specific. 3D cutscene, and some new OST music. It also featured what I call weeb rooms, which are the rooms of which you meet your waifu. Uh, I personally did not care for it, and I would have preferred its VR features to be about fighting bosses, kind of like Skyrim VR. While I enjoyed it somewhat, it also disappointed me at many turns. No DLC characters in this game, by the way. Please bring back Nitro Million God Eater. No VR fights, or VR concepts I care for. Mixed feelings on the new mechanics all lead to me having this be a lot lower than it should. Hyper Dimension Neptunia Action Unleashed. Yeah, this one is a bit out there, but thankfully for the most part, I explained in previous ranks why I love Action Mew so much. The OST music, dress break, and the story is so small that it borders on non-existent. However, that's how obnoxious Tamsoft is about their nut games. They are so bad that I preferred less content that packs a punch like Action Mew rather than cell phone fan fiction like Megatech. You, you could say I hate Tamsoft to the point where my Tamsoft hate actually exceeds Dardigan's hate for David Cage. Hyperdimension Neptunia Mark II. Yeah, here's where I get a bit more technical here. Mark II is incredibly underrated. It is considered one of the most disliked games out of the series. For me, it is one of the most enjoyable. It's the predecessor as to what would become the Reefer format slash victory format. It also has darker, coarser language, a fitting of a grim dark game like Mark II. The conquest ending is also here and is better with its writing. Not to mention a suggestion that if you start with the conquest ending as the first ending, the end theme, Go Love and Peace, is so heartbreaking that it loops back to pure catharsis. Nothing is more cigarette consuming of a downward spiral than Go Love and Peace after going Doom Guy all over our favorite waifus. I also like the APSP system. Constant limitations forced you to make decisions you thought you felt were best. That is what we in the gaming industry call investment. Everything about Mark II, aside from text boxes and 3D models are inherently superior. It also features IF coming out of the closet for Kampa, which is just plain cathartic for those who like Neps for their shoujo I, or as a Yuri, because there's more implications now. Also, Mark II has the best 2D sprites of the franchise. There is so much fun to be had here. Speaking of which, the original Hyperdimension Neptunia game. This game is entertaining to experience. Everything from the luscious world design, eye-catching nation imagery, to massive character development, first in Kampa being beautifully written in regard to the integrity, to juggling heavy themes. Also, great OST, even if it was poorly arranged. The lore is so much richer in this game than the others. Even further, the biggest criticism people have, i.e. the mechanic system, is in actuality easy 
to understand and a pro tip. If you want to use the healing mechanics in their full capacity, by pausing the menu, you can literally change to whatever metal skill, medical skill you want in battle. And I mean in battle, you can change it in the menu if you have the other components needed to have it be used. You can heal vast amounts and other effects when you understand how the mechanics works. It does not hold your hand at all, and I love it. It, ex it encourages exploration, battle, and learning things for yourself. Also, all of these special attack designs look much better than their rebirth counterpart. Not to mention, there are these special CD attack easter eggs that deal damage. Even better, you can have some that are made from the pictures on your hard drive, even hentai ones if you like. There are so many easter eggs mechanics, nuances, that it makes me wonder if people who criticize this particular game are pure casuals. I get a legit catharsis from challenge, so maybe it is just the thrill of overcoming adversity from me personally as a preference. I don't know, take your pick. Hyper Devotion to War, Goddess Blackheart. This is where things start to make even less sense to all of you than before. However, I am riddled with the same puzzling, suspicious emotions and feelings that people who hate this game are casual elitists, or are people who just don't like it in preference. For all the talk of the mechanics being slow, clearly all they have played are Fire Emblem. Forget the Civilization series, or the various games of Risk released for consoles, or the Settlers of Catan game, the various turn-based browser games, or various others. No Nope, the issues with the pacing people have with this game are not a justified, oh, we don't like how the story pay is paced. None of those are the thing, it's just the pacing of the gameplay. Considering neither the mechanics nor the story, in my opinion, were beyond a reasonable margin. Both the story and mechanics are appropriate in length for what they are. Turn-based strategy games are intentionally slowly paced. It is there so you can feel absolute dominion and control. It is why games like Civilization have such a claim, despite being slower than Hyper Devotion Noir in pace. The only fair claim people have against Hyper Devotion Noir is the original is the lack of original soundtrack for Hyper Devotion. Yeah, don't sleep on the fact that, you know, Hyper Devotion Noir kind of laid claim and innovation for eventual usage by Mary Skelter for the Yuri Love mechanic. The mechanics are standard tier for turn-based strategy. Another good example and reference point for this game are the Record of August 4 series to the actual point where they have her as a character. If you are not a fan of turn-based strategy, feel free to skip this game if you like, because it suffers the same overbloated story issues that Victory had, regardless if it is more justified or not. I happen to enjoy a story center around Noir, and a story that actually writes R4 incredibly well as a villain. R4 is considerably smarter than her other dimensional counterparts, and is often more of a threat. She do last day CPU and her emotions into plummeting the entirety of the market into pure chaos and bedlam. She is also rightfully the final boss, and she has one of the coolest looking castles. Most of all, it gives us more of what the Four Nations can look like when generals and or NPCs step up as characters. It gives some very unorthodox lore expansion. Hyperdimension Neptunia, producing perfection. Sure, this game has a lot of weaknesses. A. Too many uh, routes to obtain 100% completion. B. The story has no coherent villain. It is just an ambiguous group called Mob 48, which I believe it parodies a KB 48, if I remember the name correctly. Which, while a fun reference, does not hide the fact that for the third time, from Tamsoft, first action new, then Mega Tag, and now this game, a mob character is the final boss. Now then, th here's where my love for Idle Trash comes in. I am actually a huge fan of Love Lot, despite it being crap. And this game does the genre more justice while making every character in this story feel energetic, without making them obnoxious bitches. They are distinct yet caring. It even made me want to protect Vert, which somehow has made me feel like it deserves a, literal, a literary prize. It took making her little sister obsession turn onto herself that made it happen. You generally do better with me when you make a character I hate in general 
general to be more likable. Generally, as a fan of something, you will dislike certain characters for what they either embody or act upon. For me, with Vert, she represents the moronic bimbo that demeans others in making them feel insecure. Demeaning others, others, sorry, demeaning others for not having big boobs makes me annoyed and her pedophilia made me cringe. So seeing Vert being a little sister was so refreshing and her mindset embodies the Emoto tropes and behavior to the point where it flipped the script up. In the end, I like things that challenge my perception of something and do it successfully. Mechanics wise, they are not bad. They are not anything remotely special or worth talking about. The mechanics are literally just a couple of buttons and the only important things to look at are special effects and camera zoom. That is the easy and uninspired mechanic. The actual difficult one is the idle dating simulator style of real life with nub girls. And now that I think about it, kind of was also the predecessor for V2R. The, um, uh, da, 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 da. As your main issue for the most part is navigating your way through so that you can be Mob 48. Honestly though, the fact that you must go through 12 convoluted endings, which is honestly the only way you will get the required four true endings actually needed without relying on a guide, to get the secret harem ending is a bit ridiculous too. Not to mention pl the platinum hunting is ridiculously tedious. It is an intense, fun experience when you sit back and take everything positive in. Super Dimension Neptune vs Sega Hard Girls I am going to be honest, these last two are so close that it is difficult for me to make my choice. I chose V2 for specific reasons. For now, what matters is how and why I enjoy this game so much. I love IF, voiced by a beloved Seiyu in Kana Ueda, a chuny tomboy, but also reliable. She is literally one of the kinds of girls I like. I love her as a main character, and her personality really shines through. I also like how they ramped up the shoujo eye and even made jokes at its expense. It also puts Neptune as a support character, which is perfect for Neptune, to be honest. Also, after some time and deliberation, I have decided that I actually like Seigami. She grew on me like fine wine, and aged like it too. Sure, the Time Eater is rather disappointing as a villain at first, but at the end it consistently makes me want a sequel center around him, and I've seen other people online feeling the same somewhat. The concepts of time travel akin to Doctor Who are always fun too. It also revamps and enhances the rebirth mechanics formula. The usage of Neptune was done best here as well, with her being a side character. Her comic relief appearances from the memetic, from the meme, from the memetic era of her character never fell short when, it, when she comes out of nowhere to say something stupid, whereas Neptune's just a main character that makes everything too meta, otherwise when put in place as the main protagonist of the series. Overall, my experience with this game is great. Mega Dimension Neptunia V2 There can only be one. Yeah, I have many reasons to enjoy this game the most. The mechanics are better than ever, partially because they switched out Guard Break with Heart Spray, made the EXE gauge easier to fill, made new maps that are fun to explore. It was a massive visual upgrade, and visually it is a mate using tooth chipped experience. I met a close friend in Seabro thanks to this game and many others. Kurome and Uzume are a much welcomed addition to the cast. Concepts like the Legionary monsters were intriguing as well. Everything was revamped, improved, and up the story structuring in hindsight was a bit suspect and was an issue of, you know, company meta, but overall they did their best to make sure three separate story ideas would eventually be melded into one and do so diegetically, of which this game therefore deserves best uh, best overall director, best story director and editor. They involved a lot of new concepts and threw them out there while hoping things would stick and and they have stuck indeed like old-fashioned super glue. Not to mention best girl DLC in God Eater Nitro Plus in Million Arthur Fight Me. God, I love those three. Also, my fucking word is the OST the best that Neptunia's ever had. Not surprising since Kenji Kaneko and Earthbound Papas, aka Nobu Uematsu's uh, little band, composed the soundtrack. This game is both a tearjerker and one of the more gratifying endings in the revival ending and the ascension ending is why 
the revival ending becomes gratifying. Therefore, I suggest you do the ascension ending before the revival ending for the sake of pure emotional catharsis. Well, that was me rambling on about these rankings despite not being in the script somewhat. A bit improvised, if you will. I hope you enjoyed this top video of NEPs. I will be doing a NEP video commission for Rafine 52 about the Japanese version of Triple V Tunia and the bikini outfits and having it in story script. And I will also probably restart and recontinue my podcast for Team Orwell because I want to use that so I can host new Neptunia podcast guests I discover. With that, ladies and gentlemen, have a good effing day. Before you go, thank you for watching this video. I'm sorry for the all like, the audio issues but tr and video issues, but trust me, this was a nightmare to edit. And originally, I was going to uh, add in a bunch of Ferris uh, sprites to like convey emotions. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, not gonna happen. Constant crashes of my video editor made me gave up on that particular video. Some of the things you will get to look forward to are, um, like, a, are the, as a special little, um, meme slash shit post that I will be giving you on Christmas on the main channel. I hope you enjoy what will come on that main channel. Um, uh, my next video for Triple P rated might be slightly, uh, might be slightly later than Friday because there's no fucking way that I'm going to be able to do the level of edits that I do and like not be able to make it alive with my sanity intact. Plus I have somebody else's commission to do first and until I get my uh, webcam I'm kind of stuck not being able to do any gameplay uploads on the Triple P channel. So yeah. I, uh, I, th I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Next presentation, I shall do be doing Ferris. And after that, no more special fucking edits. And it will go back to the original format. Because these next two episodes were the remnants of the old channel. And I thought, fuck it. Instead of, uh, in since I have my webcam is dead, might as well uh, just put it on the secondary channel. And have that be the next two episodes of Triple P Rated. And once those two episodes are done, then... Then we will go back to the webcam style of presentation. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Triple P.